You know I'm right. Nick Durst here with Joe Calabrese. This is the show that uncovers the origin stories of some of the biggest names in sports, entertainment, and news. And Joe, we have the perfect guest here for this audience today because this person is truly at the intersection of all three of those. Yeah, right. Uh, a news reporter and anchor for New York One, uh, and the son uh, of Dean Beminger. So uh, without further ado, we're going to have his son on with us today. Dean, welcome to the show. Nice to see you. Uh, like me, you have a little coffee ready to go over there. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun here, but uh, welcome to the show. How are you doing tonight? All right, doing great. Thank you for having me, guys. A uh, real pleasure to talk to you about, uh, you know, my days and years at New York One and yeah. Spectrum <laughs> 24, 25 years now, I mean, time's flying. Unbelievable, unbelievable, right? I don't know where that time went, 25 years. And I always tell people, I'm not an old guy, but I am getting older, I guess. 25 years, a lot of knowledge of covering New York City. Yeah, Dean, I, I feel like, you know, I feel like I've spoken to you before. You're just like, you're just always on it. Every time I go over to my, my in-law's house, they're always watching New York One. You put the TV on, the channel automatically comes on. And then it just it just sucked in, just just amazing stuff. So really excited to have you here. We're, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff with New York One, and and of course your your acting career. Uh, I think we're going to get you uh, an Oscar one of these days. But uh, <laughs> first, you know, just just want to know about you know, about your childhood. Uh, I'm assuming you you were pretty active uh, with sports, but you know, what was it like for you? having a father who, who played in the NBA was, and was a champion as well. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I am a New York City boy. I'm born in Harlem, raised in Bronx. Um, so a typical New York City kid. Uh, I went to Catholic schools in Bronx for 12 years. So that Catholic school education. And, uh, but, you know, it, it was a good time because I am a native New Yorker. And then you mentioned my dad, uh, my big dad, Dean, the dream Meminger. I always tell people though, you know, I was a little too young to know my dad as, as a, as a mm -hmm. baller, right. A professional basketball player. I mean, he was in the pros uh, for a few years while I was a child, but I really don't remember that. You know, right. it's when I get older that you realize, Oh, a lot of people know your dad because uh, you know, he played for the New York Knicks and the great thing about him, it just, so continues this Meminger legacy. Uh, even a part of it is with my grandfather who passed away recently at 102. His name also Dean. Uh, wow. But my dad, well, you guys know, because you know, you're know you you're sports guys. But my dad was a national champion on the high school level for Rice High School, uh, college level for Marquette University, and professionally for the Knicks. So uh, quite a great career uh, for him. Quite a great set of genes you got over there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so you got your start uh, at Pace University in, in radio. Uh, so talk about that. Yeah, you know, I, I went because I was actually my mom would always say I was raised by my mom and my stepdad. My dad was always there. My biological father's always said I had one mom and two dads. Right. So my mom would always tell me, you know, your dreams are one place, but your talents are the other. So I loved playing basketball but I was a much better track runner. So I actually went to, to Pace University in Westchester County on a partial track scholarship. Uh, but then all of a sudden I fell in love with uh, a radio and broadcasting and, and probably going to a few college parties. And all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> the, track, the, track, the track fell off and the coach was, you know, calling my parents saying, hey, this guy's not showing up to practice. Uh, but it all worked out because I joined the college radio station there at Pace University. And uh, the rest is history. You know, 25, 30 years later, you know, still doing my thing on TV and actually loving it. Yeah. So you were running in uh, straight lines in the other direction as opposed to <laughs> <laughs> where you were supposed to there. Uh, so uh, I want to talk about internships, too. And uh, what was it like? Uh, being active on campus and, and doing stuff that would eventually uh, lead you to your, your first job after college. Yeah, I mean, that, that's so important, right? Like I, I was involved with the radio um, and I'm not quite sure. I may have joined the radio station before deciding my major was broadcast journalism, right? So it kind of put me in that direction. Um, so I did 
become a broadcast journalism major. And with that, started doing TV as well. And I was clearly broadcast, guys. The print journalism, that wasn't for me, you know, trying to type articles and all of that. I, I was really more of a speaker and someone who, who loved to be out there in front of people. I eventually, uh, one of my uh, classmates, he started to get internships for us at Eyewitness News, you know, in New York City, Channel 7, Eyewitness News, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I interned there and I really um, got the bug there because it, that was a lively newsroom much like new york one now but you know that was back in the day so news a little a little different back then and the things you could say and scream out in the, in the middle of a newsroom but it was really exciting and that allowed me to say you know what i love this this is what i want to do so i encourage people especially in this industry guys because like you know you you love what you do right it's hard work it's not easy people get to hear you and see you but it's not easy and through an internship, you can find out if you really love this work or if you realize, hmm, I don't like this. These people are a little too aggressive. Yeah, and it's uh, interning, especially in media, it could be a grind because you learn about all the different times of days. You could be working the morning shift, overnight, nighttime. For you, Dean, what is your favorite time of day to, to be working? Whew. <laughs> well, that's, you know, it's hard because at New York One, uh, I, I work I work every shift, right? right. Um, especially for some sort of breaking news. I could be up, you know, early in the morning on air by 6, 6.30 in the morning. And, you know, like this week, I'm not getting off until 11 o'clock at night because I'm working the night shift. I would say... I mean, I, I like the night shift, but somewhere between that day shift and night shift, because a lot of things happen during the day where, you know, the news is coming out. So we need to jump on air and clarify what's going on or try to make sense of it. Right. Because as news people, we don't know everything. I'm going to be very honest about that, especially in a city like New York City, where there's breaking news. It's just coming in and we're trying to get it out to the public as quickly as we can, but as accurately as we can as well in New York one. So that's a lot of fun during the day. There's more people in the newsroom, so it's buzzy. Uh, but the night shift, you know, sometimes that's when a lot of things jump off as well in the nighttime, right? Nothing happens until it's dark sometimes. Right. Absolutely. The city that, that never sleeps, as we all know. So crazy stuff could happen. You did begin your career, though, in, in 1995 as a reporter on standing anchor for BronxNet. News 67. And while at Bronx Net, you also produced and hosted an entertainment show, Bronx Magazine. So how did that opportunity come about for you there to, to get that first job? And what was the process like for you auditioning or applying for that role? Wow, you're looking deep into the bio. <laughs> yeah, actually, my first job um, when I got out of school, obviously, I had the internship, but that was not paid. The first job was at, and then I got another internship at the former 98.7 KISS FM radio wow. station, with wow. R&B and a little hip hop, right? So I was doing news there. And that was unique for a station back then, a radio station, a black uh, formatted radio station, they had a full-blown news team with like three or four people in the newsroom. So I started doing news there, but you know, that was a, a great time because I had a great mentor there, Bob Slade. Um, and you know, I, that's where I actually first started working with Wendy Williams because she was How on the air them at the time. <laughs> I've known Wendy Williams a long time. And a lot of the people you hear on Sirius XM radio, that's where I met them, you know, the people who are hosting the Fly Show and um, Soul Town, Jeff Fox, uh, Bugsy, uh, DJ Red Alert, I know very well from those days. Then I switched from that and I actually started working at WO Radio 710M. So I was working at both stations at one time and I, and I credit that because I had mentors at WOR as well. And I was working for you know, what was considered WOR in the newsroom, uh, a station that really geared to an older audience, but a, a white audience and maybe, you know, somewhat middle to conservative. And at the same time, I was working for a black music station. Mm -hmm. So I, I really got experience all around. And I think that has, you know, given me the foundation as to where I am today. I try to go right up the middle the best I can. Um, and in terms of TV, now, I met uh, a gentleman named Rich Macuso, who is a sports guy. And um, he said, you should come to Bronxnet. You know, we have a, a TV station in the Bronx. 
and met me. They loved me and they said, come on board. And, you know, as a Bronx native, I was right at home there at uh, Public Access TV Bronx now, just still around doing fabulous work. And then in 97, uh, New York One came knocking. They needed a Bronx reporter. I was from the Bronx and worked at a Bronx TV station. And bam, there it was. It, you know, it was a marriage. I, I don't know if I can say made in heaven, but it was a good <laughs> marriage. <laughs> So was there any point uh, early on in your career, that at that point in your career, where you were thinking to yourself, okay, I, I have uh, a little bit of a background doing a little, couple of different things. So uh, I think doing news, I think doing sports, and I think doing entertainment. Uh, now you kind of need to get a little bit luckier to work in and stuff like sports and entertainment if you want to do the fun things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but at that time, did you think of kind of going in one direction? Did you think of saying to yourself, you know what? Could be the lead sports anchor, uh, like uh, like let's say like an older Kingston on CBS Two now, or did you say like oh maybe the entertainment world, the entertainment side of things where you're doing stuff related to music, R and B and hip hop, you know maybe that's the kind of route that I'm gonna go, or do you think this is working for me so far? I'm gonna continue trying to working in, uh, or staying in generic news and using my experience, knowing that area in the Bronx to my advantage. Yeah. I mean, and one of the great things at New York One, we have what's called beat reporters or borough reporters. So each borough has its own reporter. And many times, you know, if it works out correctly, that person who's covering the borough is literally from that borough and they know it. So for me, I was from the Bronx and covering the Bronx and no shade to Staten Island, but you know, the Bronx- That's where we're from, <laughs> Dean. We're in Staten Island, Dean. No shade. No uh, but, you know, the Bronx, it's always happening, right? There's always something yeah. going on. You're talking about the home of hip hop, the birthplace of hip hop, the New York Yankees, right? Um, it's, it, you know, unfortunately, we have the history of, you know, a lot of crime in the borough. So that kept me busy. But so I was able to be very well rounded. Uh, in the Bronx covering everything. I mean, co covering corrupt politicians, you know, being their offices raided by the FBI. And then, you know, I, you know, I um, could literally, you know, do a hip hop story as well. I, I actually grew up as a young kid with Fat Joe. Um, wow. And so I, and I was able back in the day to interview Big Pun when people were not really interested on the news side. But I understood the importance of the character of Big Pun, right? This is a huge guy who's Puerto Rican, but he's a heck of a rapper. Like, we need to do a profile on this dude. So I was able to do it all. But, you know, my, my police contacts and my hard news reporting, you know, the boss has always said, you know, oh, man, you're so good at this hard news. And I'm like, no, I want to interview the celebrities, right? <laughs> so I've been able to do a, a lot of everything, you know, right now. Uh, especially in New York City, there's a lot going on with crime and politicians and policing. So, you know, sometimes we say, you know, we need you on this hard news, right? So I have to stick to that. But then, you know, very easily I'll say, you know, this big entertainer who's won three Grammys is going to be in New York. I think I should be interviewing him. And they say, ah, go ahead and do it. So I really want to be well-rounded. And I think, guys, uh, and I count my blessings here because we know in our industry, it's so hard to to keep a job sometimes, or to be happy in the job, even yeah. if you have the job because it's so demanding. So to be, you know, doing this for 25, 30 years, and, you know, one week, literally, I'm interviewing Maxwell, who's going to be performing at Barclays, and then, you know, the next day interviewing the mayor and the police commissioner of New York City. You know, that that's really uh, pretty interesting, and, and it keeps it moving for me. It never gets stale. Yeah, well, it's great that they give you that flexibility. And that's really why you've been able to be there for 25 years, because it's really unheard of now in the industry that anyone's at a particular station for, you know, more than a decade, 15 years, it just seems like things are always changing. So it's great that they give you that flexibility, and you get to express your personality, do a bunch of different things. So one of the things, you know, you're, you're most well known for is you were the face of New Year's Eve on New York One. <laughs> you love the shows. What year did that start how did that opportunity come about for you well and actually i'm gonna plug myself so you know you go to my twitter instagram at dean memager you can see all of those great new year's eve <laughs> jackets that i wear yeah. people love that right I, I i that you know even though i'm like 
right up the middle, maybe a little conservative when to doing the news, like yeah. in conservative, you gotta be, you know, very stoic, right? But the New Year's <laughs> Eve show, I can just let loose. Um, yeah. I actually probably, man, I had to have started in the late nineties, unbelievable in terms of, I was out there in Times Square yeah. on that big media platform, you know, back in the day interviewing people like Lindsay Lohan and, you know, not even knowing uh, Jordan Sparks. I mean, really, when I interviewed Lindsay Lohan, I didn't even know who she was, but they were like, yeah, this big star is going to come up here to do an interview with you. But, you know, she's like, you know, for a younger audience or for Disney, I had to call young people in my family, like, who's this Lindsay Lohan? They're like, you don't know who Lindsay Lohan is? <laughs> <laughs> right? And yeah. then I did that. And then eventually I was able to move inside to be a part of, you know, just hosting it from the inside. And I, I would say that has been going on now for, oof, I want to say 15 years. It could be a little more or, or a little less, but, right. you know, 15 years uh, of doing the New Year's Eve show on New York One. Uh, you know, every December 31st, ringing in the new year. That's, that's really fun. Yeah, much warmer inside, I'm sure. Hey, 100%. So that, <laughs> that gig works out when it's like 20 degrees outside. Yeah, and you mentioned this, the tuxedos. And this this past New Year's, you did an outfit change. So how Ooh. far out how far out are you thinking about what you're going to wear for the New Year's Eve special? <laughs> Probably pretty far out because people are like hitting me on social media. Hey, Dean, wear this jacket, wear that jacket. But it's really maybe um, I really start thinking about it four to six weeks out, like saying, OK, Dean, don't wait until the last minute, you know, like yeah. let's find something. And it gets harder each year. You know, I, it's not doing this all myself, guys. Like it's a real surprise. No stylist. My, my wife does not. Yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty good stylist, though. Yeah. So, no, you know, <laughs> my wife, my wife doesn't know what I'm going to wear. Ooh, and surprise for her. The station, the people at the station, the producers, um, the, the technical director, the camera people, they do not know because I want it to be a surprise for them as well. There's literally maybe one person um, at the station that knows, you know, because I do want to bounce it off of someone. So I really keep it a secret and they're all amazed, you know, in the studio when I come out. And when I did that, that, that outfit change this year, you're right. <laughs> they were like, oh, wow. And I almost didn't make it because you have to put on the bow tie and, right. oh, a mic, yeah, everything's got to be pulled over. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of being right, maybe we'll send you over some gear and you can wear that. Uh, yeah, I, you know, a lot of people probably will say that. I always think you're right, Dean. <laughs> you know I'm right. You know I'm right. Now you, can, now you can show them this podcast appearance and you can be like, you know what? I am right. And I've always been right. <laughs> Dean, what... Uh, for you, what do you, what would what do you remember being the coldest you've ever been doing a report? Obviously, you know if it's snowing, sometimes they send you out. New Year's Eve is freezing, but you know, or if it's just like oh, record low temperatures, they're going to send you out. So, what do you, what do you remember being the the coldest you've ever been going out in the field to report? And I guess you could also tell me like the hottest you've ever been. I know you've been out there during some heat strokes, like heat strokes <laughs> and blackouts, but I'm uh, just curious, you know, with that when you're out in the field. Oh, man, you guys are good. That's a great question because people usually don't think about that. But I was laughing at some of the uh, new reporters at New York One. You know, I said, oh, you wanted to be a star. And then I see them out there. They are absolutely freezing. You can't speak <laughs> because it's like zero degrees and ice coming out of your, you know, your nostril. Yeah. All. Um, I would say that there's one was way back many, many years ago, an unfortunate situation, a crime scene in the Bronx. Um, at a shooting at a sneaker store and we were just waiting for them to the police to talk and to bring the the victims unfortunately out of the out of the store but we just had to stand there for hours um in the cold you know waiting you couldn't leave because you wanted to see what was going on and the other day which was pretty interesting the uh, the miracle on the huts i actually saw the plane in yeah. the air on fire um, I was in the Bronx and I saw that. So eventually, you know, I say something is going on with a plane. It's on fire. And my newsroom, they were like, Dean, are you yeah, sure? Yeah. And the next thing we know, everything's going crazy. A plane's in the Hudson. And you were the only cold. person to get footage of the plane as it was I going. I got footage of the plane. I mean, I did not catch it on fire because it was traveling. Um, and I saw it. And by the time I got my camera out, it was starting to come back. But it was literally floating 
through the air. And I says, oh, it's trying to make it back to Guardia. But obviously he decided to go to the Hudson River. But when we got down to the Hudson, I mean, that day, you know, I think it was in January, right? Um, if I'm correct, it was absolutely freezing. And we are standing, you know, on the edge of the Hudson River on the west side of Manhattan. It was freezing. And the one thing I, I, why I even say it's a miracle on the Hudson, we were freezing, but imagine you know, being out there standing on the wings of that plane in the middle of Hudson River between New York and New Jersey. I mean, that it really was a miracle. People survived the, the, the landing, didn't drown and didn't freeze out there. Yeah, that is probably one of the, I mean, obviously outside anything related to 9-11, but one of those like crazy stories that, you know, people are like, oh, I remember where I was when that happened or, um, so that was necessarily cool, but I want to ask you about uh, your other experiences in particular, uh, your more cool, uh, enjoyable, uh, fun things that you got to do. So uh, is there any particular story, uh, location, or even person uh, outside of Lindsay Lohan, because you mentioned her before, uh, any one of those particular stories uh, off the top of your head uh, that you could share with us that think that comes to mind? Mm hmm I mean, you know, being blessed to work in New York City, right? So, you know, you're talking about uh, eight and a half a million people just living in the five boroughs and millions more coming here for tourism and work every day. So there, there's so much there. Um, yeah, I'd have to think hard, but obviously I've had some great stories where, you know, I've actually traveled out of New York City, out of the country because of the importance of a story to New York City and the people who live here. I mean, one, um, you know, I was the only local TV reporter from New York to travel to South Africa for Nelson Mandela's funeral. I mean, that was definitely a privilege. Um, uh, I traveled and documented uh, African families from New York to travel home because their families died in a fire. That was just an epic uh, journey and a, a really uh, a great bit of journalism to show how they went from the Bronx back home to bury their family members. But, you know, I've been at, to the Fukushima region of Japan one year after the tsunami. I literally, you know, was in that region, was shut down. So I don't know if in a couple of years I'll start glowing because my doc was like, is there anything I should take before I go? And my doctor was like, no, don't go. <laughs> but I went anyhow. Um, and, you know, when we all wear masks, you know, throughout the pandemic, we were wearing masks. But I actually had to wear a mask long before that for swine flu. Swine flu hit New York City many years ago. And I traveled to what was the epicenter back then, guys, Mexico. And literally, you know, wearing masks back then. Um, and then you guys are like this one. This is a story I always tell. He probably doesn't remember. But as the Bronx reporter, you know, in the late 90s, throughout, not only late 90s, throughout the 90s, early 2000s, we're talking about the championship Yankees, right? Um, and uh, you know, so I was always at Yankee Stadium covering a game that the bosses would literally take off of the anchor desk. No, no, no. We want you in the Bronx covering the Yankees. Have fun with the fans. I'm like, no, I want to anchor the news. Um, <laughs> and one day, you know, I had my mic cord and my camera person is, you know, a few feet away from me. And you would stand at the, the press entrance, the media entrance, because that's where the players would go in. And literally one day I almost choked Derek Dieter with the microphone ah. cord because I had the microphone cord through and it hit him like this. I was like, oh my goodness, I almost killed Derek Jeter before a game. You know, uh, those were fun times. And remember back then, man, you know, during that time, all of the celebrities would be out. So I would be interviewing, you know, back then, you know, Donald Trump, you know, long before he became president. And he's a big, he watched New York One because the same way he watches the national channels, but as he was in New York, he was watching New York One all the time. He knew who we were. I would be interviewing Donald Trump. I mean, Jay-Z, Puffy, uh, Regis Philbin, you know, and may he rest in peace, you know, um, so many people. So that was really fun, um, you know, that you you don't forget those times, you know, and, and then, you know, when you're at home and they win a championship and people are, you know, going crazy in the streets. You know, those definitely are fun times. So who would you love to interview that you've never interviewed before? Hmm. Who would I love to interview? I mean, you always think about the big, big names, right? You think about, oh, you know, presidents. I've actually 
interviewed former President Bill Clinton a few times. Um, you know, you think about maybe, you know, Barack Obama for me to talk to him, you know, just about what he stood for, what he hoped, and if he accomplished that just for the country in general, for everybody, right? And but also for, you know, he spoke a lot about young black men. And, you know, I know that becomes, you know, a polarizing issue, but the reality is that, you know, he realized that young black men needed a little extra and he wanted to do more for them. So I really would like to talk to him about if he thought he succeeded in that and, you know, what more could he do now, you know? Um, also, you know, hey, Oprah's interviewing everybody. I'd love to, to sit down with O and just chop it up, right? Like I'm the kind of person like you guys, um, I'm, I am just talk. You know, and that's what I would want to do. I wouldn't want to be like, yeah, this is Dean Manger interviewing Oprah Winfrey. No, I would like to, you know, just chop it up with her. And, you know, wherever she takes me, that's where I would go. Because you know, there has to be another side of Oprah. You know, all of us, you know, we want people to see us, guys. But I always say, I don't know if I would want to be Oprah. Because I don't, Oprah can't go anywhere. You know, she had everybody that's around her, you sign a confidentiality form. Everybody recognizes you, you have a billion dollars. You know, like, I don't think we hear from Oprah a lot about, you know, life is great for her, but that has to be, what do you guys think that you can't even go to your local CVS or shop, right? <laughs> you know, without, you know, paparazzi, you know, over the cereal aisle taking pictures of you. Dean, do you remember the first time that you were recognized in public? Uh, I don't don't remember the 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 first time. Um, you know, obviously it happens a lot now, and it is fun. Um, but it does get to the point, you know, and because I come from, you know, that world, my late dad, right, as a, as a, a an athlete who was well known and a celebrity, like you know, being out with him. And people, you know, always coming up, wanting to take pictures, you know, of us. And, and that was fun. Now what I try to do sometimes with myself, because people love New York one and I love them. So I want to, you know, take pictures. I love taking pictures. But when I'm, when I'm with my family, I try to put back a little bit from that. Because I, as you said, I'm always on TV. I'm always working. So right. when I'm with the family, I try to give them, you know, their time. But I love it because, you know, I, I always say is that you never know when you can change somebody's world or life. You know, somebody watches me on TV, they may see me more than they see their own family members. And so just taking that time to talk to someone, it may make their day. They may be having a tough day. And, you know, I may walk up with a big smile and you know, take a selfie with them. And, you know, that makes the world of difference. We hear the stories all the time where people meet people they love, celebrities or news pool athletes, and they turn out being, you know, horrible to them and, and yeah. people are devastated. So I never want that to be the situation. So I, I love for people to come up to me. Um, you know, and you laugh, it was, Donald Trump was one of the funniest ones. Or so when celebrities, and it happens all the time, wow. like I'm not thinking about big time celebrities, but they come through and they go, oh my God, Dean, I watch you all the time. Awesome. I'm like, Great, you know, you're you're in mega movies, right? Yeah. And Donald Trump was one of them. You know, you go up and you go, hey, Dean Memmacher from New York One. I know who you are, Dean. I watch New York One all the time. And, and like I said, that, that was 20 years ago. So things are, you know, pretty fun. I'm just doing my job. But, you know, you have to realize people are watching you and everything you do. Yeah. And it's so true because, you know, sometimes they say, like, you don't want to meet your heroes because then you can get let down. So you always got to be <laughs> on guard with that. And, you know, locally, you're very well known, but globally now, you are a big movie star. Recently, yeah, right. <laughs> recently, you became the only actor to appear in both Marvel and the DC universes. You played yourself in the new Spider-Man and Batman movie. First of all, I want to know, you've been in many films, but how'd you get into acting in the first, in the first bit? I'm guessing maybe it's a story of someone was directing a movie or something, they live in New York, they seen you on TV, they approached you. And then also what was the experience like in those two big blockbusters? <laughs> well, I would say, I mean, I, I know how to act up. I, I'm just playing myself. So <laughs> it's a little bit of acting until somebody goes, no, do it this way. I'm like, uh, you do know I'm a news reporter and this is how we would do it, right? <laughs> and no, we would do it this way though. Um, yeah, you know, the, the blessing of uh, New York one is that you're right. We are the 24 our news channel covering New York City. So 
they know like when something happens, you see that breaking news button come up on New York One or on our Spectrum News app that people watch, right? Um, and they do request us. A lot of people have been from New York One in plenty of movies, especially when they're about New York City or something that's supposed to be New York City, right? Um, but, you know, I don't get into the whole thing because I'm not a huge comic person, you know, so I don't get into the the, the universes. I, I didn't care too much about that because I didn't know really much about it. Right. Um, but they wanted somebody, you know, who was recognizable in New York City and who could do it for real. So that's how the, the Batman thing came. Uh, not the Batman, the Spider-Man. I'm getting confused. I'm the Spider-Man and Batman. <laughs> the Spider-Man thing came up and you know it was just you know 10 12 seconds you know and you know I, I i got like eight seconds in the movie but people who are from new york immediately recognized my voice and they saw me on the screen and, and i'm not going to get away because maybe people won't see it for a while you know um but it was fortunately for me my news reporting scene was such a big part of yeah. the movie you know, um, people are saying they're crying and all. And the next thing they see my big head pop up. They're like, what is this? <laughs> Spider-Man. <laughs> and then the Batman was pretty interesting, right? Uh, I was seen in several parts of that. And, you know, that was actually, guys, shot in London. I don't know if I was supposed to say that. Wow. That was shot in London. We had to go to <laughs> And stay in London you know, to shoot that thing about something that, you know, is about Gotham City. Um, and so that that was pretty fun. And to see how it all worked out, you know, um, it, it's exciting to do that. Hopefully I'll get the opportunity uh, to do more. And, uh, you know, I'll have to, you know, I have to renegotiate my contracts now. So, no, no, I, I need more money because I'm the newsman for these movies. But, no, we all do it at New York One. And it's just fun. One day you're interviewing Lindsay Lohan, the next you're talking with the, the former president of the United States, and the next day you're in London shooting a, an action. <laughs> yeah, it's a, yeah it's, I call it Dean's world. It's Dean's yeah, world. Yeah, the Dean-verse. I love it. It's <laughs> awesome. But we, yeah, uh, my reaction was exactly, I'm watching Spider-Man, and I was like, oh my gosh, there's Dean. He pops up. like, <laughs> how, did, how did this happen? It's just crazy, but very enjoyable, for sure. You made a major impact in the Spider-Man movie, for sure. It was, it was a pivotal scene, even though it was pretty short. Uh, it's just incredible that we're seeing you in your branch out here. For you, though, I wanted to ask you what in your career uh, was your you know and right moment? What I mean by that is a time where you wanted to do something and you maybe asked somebody for advice. They said, Dean, uh, I don't know. I think I don't think you should do that. It's not going to work out for you. And you said, you know what? I'm going to do it anyway. And ultimately, you will see why it is that I'm right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I would say, you know, in this business, we talk about right on New York one 25 years, but I've been, it's crazy to say it, but I've been doing this almost about 30 years now. But, you know, and it used to be a time where you couldn't just start in New York and stay in New York. You had to go to, you know, some small market somewhere and work there and then work your way up. But, you know, with New York one, it made it possible for us to stay, um, you know, in, in the market and in work here because it was a cable station. It was 24 hours. They weren't paying as much at the time, but you were still able to get a great job and have great experience. I would say though, probably, you know, within the last seven years, right? So you're, you're approaching the 20 year mark and people will say, well, that's when you're actually really good. But, you know, people say, oh, you made it overnight. Well, I don't think they've ever said that about me, but people, when they say that about people, they don't realize they've been working on that craft, right? For 10, 15, 20 years. So it was somewhere between 15 and 20 years where I had consistently done big stories, had all of the right contacts. When there was breaking news in New York City, I was the one with the information. So whenever there was a little pushback, I was able to say, wait, hold on. You know, I, I got this, right? And then when your bosses and your managers start to say, you know what, we trust you, Dean, um, go for it. So that's where it kind of like opens you up, opens you up where you're not as afraid to do things, right? In news, you never want to get it wrong. But there's a possibility that a story, you know, um, you know, a major shooting on a street where people are injured and that story is just happening, the police don't even know what's going on. So when you're reporting it on TV, you're trying to speak to the sources you have and get the best information. And you don't want to be so nervous that 
I don't want to say something because I get it wrong. Um, if you get it wrong, you just correct it. You're not trying to be egregious, right? You're not trying to mislead people. And when the boss, you know, I think, you know, a, a little bit after 15 years into this, they realize like, no, this guy knows what he's doing. We trust him. And, and we know he he's, you know, just telling the story from a journalistic standpoint. Um, and so that that's where it happened. And that feels when your bosses can tell you, you know what, we trust you, Dean, go for it. We got your back. Because if, if your bosses don't have your back, you know, it look, it's a look. and I take that three pointer, right, with five seconds left, because if you miss it, you know, but, uh, you know, if you take the three pointer and you miss and your bosses still have your back, the coaches have your back. That's a good feeling. Great answers. Thank you, Dean, for doing this with us. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, I wanted to mention something quick uh, before we let you go. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the other guys, but when you told us that story before Derek Jeter, the first thing that came to my head is that scene with Mark Wahlberg and the other guys. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen it. I don't know if Nick has ever seen it, um, but it's it's the it's similar oh, you story. Shot. It was probably inspired by Dean choking out Derek Jeter with the light. <laughs> but that, is that, so, is that, is that is that their cop, uh, their cop thing? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a scene in the movie where Mark Wahlberg, uh, him and Will Ferrell, are both cops, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the big Samuel L. Jackson in The Rock. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And then there's a scene in the tunnel where Mark Wahlberg uh, accidentally shoots Derek Jeter, and <laughs> Jeter has some really funny, uh, colorful line that I'm not going to repeat, uh, but it's very evident that the other guys. Uh, use the inspiration for that scene from you, from you almost choking Derek Jeter. I can't believe that happened, but uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to He probably doesn't that. remember it, but I, I definitely do. <laughs> Something good for you to watch, you know, every... Yeah, uh, I've, seen, I've seen parts of it, that's why I know who's in it, but I don't know if I ever watched the whole thing, uh, but I, 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 I will now. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but Dean, thanks again for doing this with us. Uh, what we do here, we always like to give our guests the last words. And there's a lot that you shared and uh, promote for yourself during the, uh, the show. Uh, so it seems like you've had really, really great answers for us the whole time. So uh, we will give you the last word. And once again, uh, Nick and I thank you again for doing this with us. It's very, very rare that we have a movie star, a uh, huge major action star coming on and doing yeah. a podcast with us. But thanks again. Yeah. And Joseph and Nick, thank you so much. Uh, you know I'm right. Oh. <laughs> you know, what I would say is for anybody getting into this field, just make sure you love what you do. Um, if you're going to be on TV, radio, podcasts, you know, if you're upset every day after doing it, it's not the right job for you. I, I'm doing this. And you guys are not paying me the, the movie star money, right, to do this. <laughs> I would I do this because I love speaking to people. Um, do this job if you're getting into it because you love the work. And if you don't love it, then I'll move on to something else you can really enjoy. Excellent last words there. We really appreciate it. So that's gonna do it here for this episode of You Know I'm Right for our very special guest who's living the dream, Dean Meminger and my co-host, Joe Calabrese. I'm Nick Durst and this has been You Know I'm Right. Mm -hmm.